I'm Mark Susky, Technical Fellow at Jensen Hughes. To wrap up this three-part series today, we will talk about how performance-based design can be applied to lithium-ion sites. We're going to start talking about some of our performance-based design solutions that we may use in these issues or the hazards that are involved. Now, one of the reasons why we would use one, a performance-based design solution, as Jens touched on earlier, is the code in a lot of aspects hasn't caught up to where the technology is going. In certain areas of the facilities and these plants are extremely large and they're you know, handling chemicals and, and other you know, hazardous materials. And the code isn't quite there yet. Um, so what we're trying to do with our performance-based solutions is we're coming up with alternative methods to meet the intent of what the code is gonna require, the life safety that's necessary inside of the code, the protections for, um, you know, the, the occupants as well as, you know, the, you know, surrounding communities and those kind of things. So, so first of all, a performance-based design is first you have to identify your hazard. Then I have to come up with a several life safety um, objectives. What are my objectives? How am I going to protect it? And then I need to determine the probability of, is this going to happen? And then I have to find some tools to help test the hypothesis of what I've just defined as my safety, my goals, and my objectives. So in a nutshell, that's basically what the performance-based design you know, wraps around. So when we look at the performance-based design approach, there are several you know, really significant advantages and there are several disadvantages. And we would be remiss if we didn't, you know, also as much as we're proponents of this performance-based design approach, we'd be a little bit remiss if we didn't also tell you some of the disadvantages that are there. So you're, you, know, you as the end users are aware to make your decisions. So one of the very, you know, the, on the top of the list positives is it provides like fire point fire protection for a specific hazard. You know, like Jens said earlier, performance-based design is completed for a lot of different aspects. Our presentation today is strictly fire protection, life safety. So those, the solutions that we use are specifically point identified to that hazard. So they're very specific. Also, as we talked about several times, it works well when the code either A, hasn't been fully defined in that hazard area yet, so we have to come up with an alternative means, is that sometimes codes may be too onerous and maybe too restrictive. So we also use the performance-based design criteria in this approach to help our clients achieve that same level of life safety. We've determined a, a, a more cost-effective solution to their problem. So several of the disadvantages and, and the number one, the lack of flexibility is kind of key. Once that performance-based design solution is locked in, that hazard, you're locked into that solution. So if, for example, whatever hazard I'm protecting, if that hazard gets changed, manipulated, or modified in any particular way, you would have to go back to redo that performance-based design to ensure that the criteria that you used during that first phase is still accurate. Uh, the next one is a lot of times it requires specialized tools and professionals and engineering firms to you know, help with creating the models and creating the, the well, assembling the data that, that Jens had spoke about earlier. So you take all that data, you put it together, you put it in a computer program or you're, you're doing computations. Um, so it usually requires an expert. And the last one is a lot of times it can take longer than the prescriptive code requirements. A typical code requirement, if I'm submitting a set of sprinkler drawings to an AHJ, it's all written right in front of him. He goes through NFPA 13, says bullet point, bullet point, bullet point, you're good, stamp, it's out the door. These solutions, a lot of times, they take a lot longer, more experts involved. Um, it'll have several layers of review process, so it is a lot more time consuming. So sometimes if time is of the essence, you know, these processes should start early on. If you know that you're going to have one of these scenarios that may require some sort of performance-based design scenario, you may want to start that process early. There are several of the tools that we use currently in EV manufacturing right now. One of them is dust hazard analysis. In certain areas within the manufacturing process, we're creating combustible dust. Now, the process equipment, a lot of times, when we install the process equipment, we, the space needed, it takes up a lot, it takes up a lot of room. 
and we can't meet the combustible dust prescriptive code when it comes to the equipment. So by performing a dust hazard analysis, we can then turn around, go to the HJ and say, yeah, we're not meeting the prescriptive code for the installation of our equipment, our dust collectors, and those types of uh, pieces of equipment. But we do have this DHA saying we are mitigating all of the hazards. Uh, Jens touched on it, so I'm just, Jens talked about the risk hazard analysis, so I'm just going to kind of touch on that a little further. That is probably one of the key items that we think is necessary when you're working in these, at, in the, in these environments. That risk hazard analysis is there, and that's really what's going to set your game plan for the rest of that design. It's going to set the design criteria for the sprinkler system. It's going to set the design criteria for any sort of smoke smoke detection systems, any sort of gas detection systems, any sort of um, you know venting that you may need, ventilation, you know those kind of uh, those kind of things, and it'll help set that. So once that's in place, you're locked in. You have your protection strategy specifically for your protected hazard. And some of the items that Jens didn't talk about, but some of the items that we look at during this process is, you know, the cell chemistry, the combustion energy. We also look at the test data, compare that to what the, the test data, and we compare that to the storage configuration. How are these cells being stored? Are we storing them right next to each other? Are we separating them? You know, those kind of things. And then the manufacturing process as a whole. And it's you know, usually done at a fairly high level. You know, in the EV manufacturing area, you know, some of the areas that we're most interested in, you know, currently are the formation where they're charging the aging and the testing areas. Because now, you know, all of a sudden they've determined that the 30% state of charge is no longer sufficient to determine if there's actually defects within the cell. So they're starting to charge the bad the cells to higher. They're starting to charge the battery, the cells up to like a 62% charge, state of charge now, which then is a little bit more, you know, for years, the industry said under 30, we're good, you know, no problem. It's kind of an inert battery, you know, not a big deal, but now we're charging that battery up to 62%. So there is, you know, research and studies being done on how that affects, how that's going to affect, you know, the overall fire and protection and life safety. And then the last one on the list is computational fluid dynamics modeling. And we do a lot of this for the battery, particularly for um, EV manufacturing. Using the CFD modeling is it's showing gas dispersion throughout a, uh, a compartment or a space or a building, simulating battery, the cells. So what this allows us to do is it allows us to target and pinpoint our detection strategy for gas a lot better instead of just thinking where we want to put these detectors and oh, I'll put them here, here, and here, or I'll just space them as the code tells me to space them. Well, this way we actually have better data knowing, okay, if I have my HVAC off, here's where my gas is going to be, or if I have my HVAC on. So it allows us a lot smarter, a lot more pinpoint, which could be, you know, in a large space, it, it could be a significant difference on how many, where I'm placing these detectors. The next one is a program we call Fire Dynamics Simulator or FDS. And this one, basically what it does is it is a fire and smoke model where we're building fake, well, I don't, don't mean they're fake, but we're building computer generated fires inside of a computer program that simulates, you know, batteries on, you know, bat uh, batteries in the process of combustion. And it allows us then to look at how that, how that fire is going to develop in that space and it also shows us how the smoke is going to migrate throughout that entire facility. So we also in conjunction with this we use another program called DTEC which will predict what temperature my sprinkler system is going to go off. So then we'll have a better understanding of A how big that fire is going to get, how quickly that fire is going to evolve and then B what temperature my sprinkler system is going to go off at. So we often use that one in conjunction with an occupant egress analysis because one of the most significant issues that we have inside of these large manufacturing areas is we, we are past our 400 feet travel distance for an F1, or even in some of the high hazard areas, we're, we're extending past that. So what we need to show the AHJ is we can still evacuate people out of that building safely while still exceeding the, the travel distances that are set inside of the prescriptive code. And by overlaying the smoke model, which gives us our available ten, uh, tenable environment time in conjunction with our egress analysis that shows how long it's going to take people to get out of the building time, we can show them by the time our fire smoke layer gets down to six feet, our people are all out of the building and they're safe and everybody's happy. And so we've, we've done that in numerous places to help out our clients. 
help get variances and get past that 400 feet travel distance. So the key takeaways, Yen's went through some of the standards and regulations, which are nice to know, and they're nice there. And UL is still doing a lot of testing, and FM, and everybody's still doing testing on this. And the codes are still evolving to this day. So, you know, stay tuned. Next year, if codes may change, and we may be talking about changes to the code. Uh, but just know that they are there. We still need to comply with those codes. The risk evaluation portion, you know, that, that is a critical item to this whole entire process. Because it does, like I said, it sets the game plan for those areas that we don't have prescriptive requirements. It really does. It gives you, you know, your sprinklers, your smoke, your, your gas detections, you know, all of those, all of those, you know, fire protection and life safety systems there that are not only to protect the people, but also the building structure and, and everybody involved. And then last was a performance-based design. You know, obviously we're a big proponent of it. We use it on a regular basis. We have the tools and, you know, the, the tools necessary to complete them. Dan's and I would like to thank all of you for joining today and hopefully we'll be uh, talking to you soon.